Welcome to today's episode of How the Game Was Won. Today we're looking at the game between Karyakin with the white pieces and Kazimjanov with the black pieces. The game was played in the 11th and final round of the FIDE Grand Prix held in Tashkent and the game was played on the 2nd of November 2014. Unlike many of the other games I've covered in this tournament, this one, by way of a change, starts with a fairly normal between inverted commas opening, and that is the English. So without further ado, let's run through the first couple of moves until we get to the first of a whole host of interesting positions that will be, that will be arising. White opens with c4, and then we have knight f6, knight c3, e5, g3, e5, c takes d, knight takes d, bishop g2, knight b6, d3, bishop e7, bishop e3, castles kingside, rook c1, rook e8, a3, bishop f8, knight f3, now in this position, black played knight and eight to d7. But I have to say that it seems a little bit illogical to me to develop the knight to d7. To me, it would seem far more logically logical for the knight to develop to its more natural square of c6. For instance, after knight c6, white to castle kingside. Black could come in with bishop g4, and white could play knight e4, but it's, it's a position that uh, Karyakin has had twice before, but playing with the black pieces. So maybe because of that, Kazimjanov has decided to to play the, the developer's knight to d7, rather, to take the game away from the type of position that Karyakin would would recognize. Either which way, the game move went to uh, was was knight and eight to d7, which obviously means that for a fairly extensive period of time, the light square bishop is going to be pinned back onto its opening square. White continued with casting kingside, got c6 played. Queen b3, knight c5, which now at long last opens a diagonal for the bishop to be able to develop along. In all likelihood, the, the square that that's going to be looking at will be the g4 square. The game continued with queen c2, and yes, the bishop comes out to g4 as as a development, black pushes the knight, the, the, the pawn to, out to b4, which forces the, the black knight to retreat again, h3 to, to hit the bishop, bishop goes back to f5, knight comes back down to d2, h6, giving a giving a retreat square for the bishop to be able to go back to should, for instance, should white push the pawn, then the bishop would be able to drop all the way back to h7 while still controlling the diagonal running down and, uh, wrong arrow, sorry, the diagonal running down to hit the queen. Anyway, in this position, white continued with rook b1. And yes, the position doesn't look all that unusual, and it's you effectively got a reverse Sicilian setup running over here. White's pushing, putting some pressure on the queen side. And but black's been able to have a chance to be able to get himself fully developed. 
Knight continues with rook c8, which again is very much in line with the reverse Sicilian type of, type of setup. Rook f to c1, knight f6, bishop c5, and it seems as though even though he's got his reversed Sicilian setup, it's as if Kazinchinov is not quite able to find a particularly useful plan. His current move plus the next couple that come after that are way too passive and all that it does is allows Kadiakin to methodically build up the pressure on the queen side. As you'll see as the as the moves unfold. Uh, he starts off by bringing the, the F knight back to D7, which allows a white to go knight C to E4, queen C7, A4, A6, and now white in turn swaps off the, the bishops in order to be able to get the rook off the power for E5. And then white then continues by pushing the knight up to c5, which is a brilliant outpost for the knight to be on, because by way of pawns, the only pawn that could theoretically at some stage push the knight away might be, for instance, the b7 pawn, but really it's going to be a half a ton of move before that, that will be able to be, be happening with the, with the situation as it is at the moment. Black continues with knight f6, queen b2, now sitting with two major pieces looking to maraud their way up the b-file and hitting at that awkward weak and backward b7 pawn. Queen e7 for black, a5. By now it's clear what, what, that whatever idea Kazimjanov might have had coming out of the opening, it didn't work. White has advanced strongly on the queen side, and Black's knight has to go way off into the corner, where it's literally effectively out of the game and allows White to play into a sequence of moves where he's a an effective piece up as far as the as far as his active pieces in the game are concerned. There the knight runs off into the corner and White's answer to that is by pushing E4. Using the the time that the black knight is pinned all the way back off in the corner, White uses the the opportunity to try and break the center wide open. Always remember that when you are playing pawn pushes through the center like this, each and every pawn push tends to leave behind a backward pawn. So always make sure that when you're making your pawn pushes that you have something in mind to take care of these backward pawns, otherwise they could come back to bite you in the end. Black continues with retreating the bishop back to h7 as I remember. As I mentioned earlier, that h6 pawn push was exactly for the purpose of leaving that h square, h7 square open for the bishop. But now that the diagonal of h7 to to b1 is now being well and truly blocked by a fairly strong-looking pawn chain that White's got developed through the squares of d3 and e4. This gives White the opportunity to bring the knight up from the queen side to c4, rook fe8, which effectively is loses black a tempo with the bishop swap that, that happened a while ago, and now bringing the rook back to the same square that, where it was before. White plays f4, e takes f, g takes f adding another pawn into that central pawn, pawn chain that, that, that White's developing. 
rook b8 for black, queen e5. The screen side is looking way stronger at the moment, and not to mention the, the strong center that black white's building up at the same time. That leaves black effectively the king side to be able to do some sort of counterplay, but with that knight that's still blocked off way off in the a8 corner, there's no way that he's going to be able to generate much counterplay on the king's side in any time soon. Queen f8 for black, retreating all the way back to the bank rack. Queen d6. And Kariakin knows that that if he's able to force black to exchange queens then he doesn't have to worry about pushing his pawns too far because then his king will never be in any danger so obviously with the queens off the board then his pawns can just continue their marauding track all the way up the board the game continues with rook e7 f5 strengthening that pawn chain that I mentioned earlier so now really black is sitting with a knight that is effectively out of the game and a bishop that's effectively out of the game so by playing care carefully and strongly on the queen side at the moment it's basically white playing in a virtual two minor pieces up situation Black continues with knight c7, trying to bring the knight out to do something. The queen comes back to f4. Knight f8. King h2. For, for what? I mean, here for instance, instead of playing king h2, white could have put, dropped the, the knight down onto b6 which is then already winning as dropping a knight down onto that incredibly weak looking d7 square will be just about impossible to stop but the move that that Kalia can play in the game is, is good enough to secure the win anyway bringing the king up to h2 because what is black really going to be able to do and the only thing that Kazimjanov is able to come up with is the king move on to h8 which allows the bishop to come up black now retreats his bishop back down onto the onto the g8 square maybe with the with the view of pushing a pawn to be able to allow some space for the bishop to get out but really it's, it's a little bit too little too late and with his pieces pinned back way off against the side of the board his position paints an incredibly bad picture and with his way superior superior space and piece mobility Kalyakin just finishes the game off in a very very surgically clean way by playing Knight e5, knight f6, rook g1, knight b5, and the crushing move of knight e6. For instance, impossible for, for black would be to answer, for instance, with f takes, because with f takes, all that will happen is white plays knight g6 check the king comes to h7 and the queen drops so that that option is definitely off the table so the best possible option that answer that Kazimjanov can come up with in this essentially lost position is to play g5 and by playing g5 that just allows the queen to drop off the board Black exchanges queens, but then the knight comes back to, 
to g6 with check, f takes g6, knight takes g6 check, and the rook will be falling on the very next move. So really, in this completely hopeless situation, looking at being a full rook down, Kazinjinov resigned the game, and Karyakin brought home the full point. So that is how the game was won. Please post your comments and questions down below, and remember to click the thumbs up like button down below as well. Share this video out amongst your chess friends, and remember while you're on the, on the topic of clicking things just below the, screen, the, the video screen here, click that big red subscribe button as well. That way you can say subscribe to my channel, stay up to date with new games as I post them on a week to week basis which will be including each and every single game of the World Championship match between Anand and Carlson starting on Saturday the 8th of November. Stay carved up for the win, stay safe out there, I'll be seeing you next time, cheers.